Let's try this again, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. This is Teddy Wilson with Seekers of Yahweh Ministries. And that's what I get for leaving my mouse on the event button. <laughs> so again, here we are, uh, restoring our Hebrew mind on Friday Night Live with Seekers of Yahweh Ministries. And tonight we're going to be going over a few questions that you guys have sent in over the, uh, well, one of them is an archived one that I had in the pile. And the other one was sent in uh, just a few days ago. And the questions that we're going to be answering this evening is, how do we explain the law of Messiah? And that's pertaining to Galatians chapter 6 and at verse 2. And then also somebody sent in and asked a question. Reading Psalms 107 verses 1 through 7, it clearly shows our inability to always please Yahweh why does he even bother with us well we're going to be going over that and if we would have just read in 106 a little further we would have seen the answer to that but Psalms 106 has a lot more than just the first uh, uh, seven verses to say about what happens to Yahweh's people and why he looks at us the way he does at times. So we're going to be going over that chapter in general uh, in answering that question. We're going to be conducting a couple of Hebrew word studies. And I want to make sure that audio and video is okay with everyone. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, <clears throat> so the testing that I did a little earlier showed a lot clearer picture than what we're getting right now, but I would think that after the uh, live feed is over in the recorded version, it should be a lot better. Uh, please, you guys, don't be afraid to text me and let me know if the picture is clear or pixelated, because again, we have uh, one more thing on the back burner, just in case the video is not coming across clearly, because we do want to make this program work. It is such an awesome program. And I have uh, CenturyLink, who is our uh, server up here on it, trying to help me. And yesterday we had to uh, do some repairs on the modem and we're trying to get it dialed in as best as possible. So please bear with us. Um, let's see. Join us tomorrow for our Seeker Sabbath Live, where we're going to be recording a new Torah portion teaching. On um, The Torah portion will be Akev. And we're going to be looking very uh, studiously at this, uh, why they call this specific portion Akev. And uh, the deeper meaning to that Hebrew word um, is where we will begin tomorrow. So please join us at noon Pacific time uh, for that live broadcast as well. So let's go ahead and get right to it this evening. Let's go ahead and pray and everybody get your pens and pencils, paper. And we are going to be doing a Hebrew word study or two, maybe three depending on how far we want to take that. And let's go ahead and get started this evening. Everybody get your books ready, and let's get to Yahweh in prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Yahshua, we come before you this evening. And as we enter into your Shabbat, we seek your peace, your rest. We seek knowledge and wisdom and understanding that comes from you, Father. Lead us and guide us. We invite your Ruach to be with us as we just dive into your word and seek you. Help us to understand. Help us to see the deep things concerning your word, your ways. Father, we just pray that you would um, bless this whole evening of study and that every word said here this evening be for the purpose of furthering our understanding about you who you are, what you expect of us, and what you have planned for us in your kingdom reign. 
Father, we bless you, and I pray over all of the saints, all of the called out ones that may be uh, in need of certain prayers. We pray over, pray over each and every one of them and ask that you would meet the petitions, Father, in the mighty name of Yahshua. Hallelujah and amen. Okay, so we're going to begin uh, by looking at Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, again answering the question, how do we explain the law of Messiah? Um, let's go ahead and read Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, so that we can kind of see um, if you just read this one verse, it can take on a, a whole different meaning. And that's usually what's happened in uh, most church settings is they just read this one verse. Um, it says, bear one another's burdens and so complete, many of you are seeing the word fulfill, and many of you are seeing the law of Messiah. And in the scripture it says the Torah of Messiah, which that word should be translated as to wrote. As we're going to see, um, it has to do with the instructions of the Messiah. And um, just reading this one verse makes it sound as if the law of Yahweh in the Old Testament has been replaced. Remember, that's what we're dealing with most often is Christian replacement theology. And we're even going to see how that has bled over into many of the Hebrew roots teachings. And that's where a lot of us are getting uh, the initial impact of uh, coming into the to the truth is from uh, either Messianic Judaism or the Hebrew Roots Movement itself. Um, so again, the way we read this in most English versions, it makes it seem as if the law of Yahweh in the Old Testament has been replaced by the law of Messiah in the New Testament. So Christians say the law of Messiah replaced the law of Moses. And again, many Hebrew roots teachings claim that no one has been held accountable uh, or has transgressed Yahweh's law until Moshe wrote it all down. And so when I went to looking at all of the different teachings out there concerning this subject, the law of Messiah, I'm going to screen share something with you right now uh, of one of the many that I looked at concerning, you know, what's what's being taught on this subject out there. So I'm going to screen share with you and show you what I mean. And then we're going to take it to scripture. So here we see, right here, what this Hebrew Roots teacher wrote. He says, men were sinners before the law was given, but they were not transgressors of the law until the law was given. Now, this is from a, a notable source in the Hebrew Roots Movement on their teaching concerning the law of Messiah. And look what he says there. But they were not transgressors of the law until the law was given. Okay? So he was saying that we were guilty of sin and breaking the commandments of Yahweh, but we were not uh, held accountable as transgressors until Yahweh gave Moshe the law in written form. Now let's take that and that type of theology to the Hebrew chalkboard. Okay. Everybody turn with me to Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6 and at verses 6 and 7. I delight in kindness and not slaughtering. 
many of you are saying that he delights in mercy and not sacrifices. And in the knowledge of Elohim more than burnt offering. See, so the knowledge that Yahweh wishes for us to, to uh, understand him with is key in all of this. It says, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. Now, the majority of the teachings that I've seen from a Hebrew roots perspective all made that same exact statement that I just read you uh, when I screen shared it. In many of your versions, verse 7 in Hosea chapter 6 says, but like man. But if you look up that Hebrew word, it's Adam. And this should have been used in the noun form as in the personal noun of the first man, Adam. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they acted treacherously against me. Adam was held as a transgressor right here according. And when you read this in Hebrew, it's very apparent what's being said. So yes, Yahweh has always hold, held us as transgressors. Um, even from the days of Adam and Hawa in the garden. Everybody transgressed the law. So those types of teachings are not true. You have to be very careful where you're gleaning from. And if if uh, if the guy that's trying to, to teach or share things with you is reading out of a King James, you'll never see this. And he's going to go on uh, teaching this uh it, it's a falsehood. It's a lie. It's not true. Um, over and over and over, enough to where people believe it as the truth. You tell a lie enough, and pretty soon it becomes the truth. Okay? So, um, yes, we have always been uh, accountable for trespassing or transgressing against Yahweh's commandments, even from Adam and Hawa. So that, that is not true. So here we see uh, that this word transgressed is used. So I want to do a Hebrew word study on that so that you can understand that um, this accountability, it's directly connected to the covenant, okay, where we are reading in uh, Galatians chapter 6, it's covenant issues just as much as it was in the days of Adam or Moshe. It's always a covenant issue. Sinning against the covenant rules is transgression of the law, the Torah. So that word transgressed is number 5674 in your Strong's Concordance, and it's pronounced a bar. Now, this word has came up a couple of times uh, here recently in our word studies. And in the Strong's, it means to cross over in this context, okay? So what it's saying is, is that Adam and everybody else stepped out of bounds, stepped out, crossed over that boundary that Yahweh had made, made by his rules in order for us to remain in covenant. Once you begin to step outside of the right rulings, the judgments, the precepts, and the instructions, you are then out of covenant, and you have become a covenant breaker, which is trespassing that boundary that Yahweh has made for us to stay in confine, uh, confinement in covenant. Safety. Yeah, it's a safety shield. But we we cross outside of that boundary and then we become susceptible for uh, all of the things that we do outside of the body or the confines of Israel, or in our case, the body of Messiah. So that's the only difference. You had, uh, you had uh, Adam and Hawa broke the covenant, transgressed it. Moshe, the Israelites that he instructed, they did the same exact thing. And we at some point, have done the same thing as well. There's only one way to fix that. And it's how Yahweh says 
that you come back into the boundaries with him and the rules will not change. There is no such thing as we're going to see as a law of faith, a law of Messiah, a law of Moses, because that English word law doesn't always, should not always be uh, interpreted or, or uh, translated as law. Many times it's talking about to wrote instructions, um, and then there are times it's talking about a law in the Torah. It's talking about Torah as in the whole scroll that Moshe wrote on. And if we don't know um, exactly which one is talking about, you cannot teach the truth of Yahweh's word. That is the outcome of, of all of it, is the inability to make others or share with others and come to the proper understanding of what was actually being conveyed. So I'm going to show you by scripture, uh, after we do this Hebrew word study, um, exactly what was going on, because those scriptures actually define themselves, and it's going to be something totally different than you see as in law of Messiah. Yahshua himself said, that I come to you teaching my father's words, not my own. So the father's words were recorded through Moshe and the prophets. He never claimed to have his own law, but yet many people are going to say he had it. <laughs> he would be a transgressor if he set up a boundary of, of laws that were not the same as the fathers. That would mean he trespassed and transgressed the father's commandments as well, and that would make him just as much of a sinner as us. Never happened. Did not happen. Now, in the ancient Hebrew lexicon, that word transgressed or a bar is number 2520V. Twenty five twenty V. And here you'll see it. Ian Bet Resh. Ian Bet Resh, a bar. Okay, so we see that it has to do with uh, the I, meaning knowledge. Understanding, looking upon, and then we have uh, the bet, which is a tent floor plan, or the house, or the people, family in the house, and then we have the picture of the resh, which is the head of man or uh, head, head of the household, those types of things. All right, now, let us read the definition. 2520V. It's on page 399. Right hand column towards the bottom of the page. And there you'll see it's being used as a verb. And it says cross, to cross over a river or cross through a land. And then you'll see when it's used as a noun, it means side as being across from the other side. And look at the second definition there, beyond. So it has something to do with going beyond, crossing over and going beyond something in its context. And then up there at the top of the root line, 2520, um, it says the action route is to cross and the crossing over or passing through a land or water to gain access to the side beyond. So that is what it's trying to say. Trespassing or transgressing Yahweh's covenant means you go anywhere beyond what he has laid down as a foundation. Once you make a decision to do what is contrary to what Yahweh has said in his right rulings and his judgments, you are out of covenant. This is why Yahshua's blood 
is so very important. It doesn't do away with the commandments, the mitzvot themselves, but what it does is giving us avenues back into the boundaries of the house. Okay? So, again, what this is showing us, there is that word abar, once again, ayin, bet, resh. And so this transgressed means this type, and, and used in this context, it means this type of trespass in the walking away from or crossing over the boundaries of the knowledge of the tent floor plan appointed by the head of man and this concerning his covenant. So when you look beyond the tent floor plan or you, or you uh, go beyond by your own knowledge, put yourself outside of the original tent floor plan, the one that was appointed by the head of mankind, then you have transgressed the covenant. You are out of covenant. So then there are all of these sacrifices that needed to be made. Now we have Yahshua, but that does not uh, give us, uh, uh, it doesn't make us enable to break that same covenant. <laughs> so it is a way back into that boundary, but you can always step outside of that boundary once again. So again, um, in this context, it's telling us this type of trespass is the walking away from crossing over the boundaries of the knowledge of the tent floor plan appointed by the head of man concerning his covenant. So that ion, meaning knowledge, this means that if you come to a conscious decision that you made, you make that decision based on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. You under, this is, this is going to be key in that as, uh, respect as well. Um, when you lean towards your own understanding and you don't seek the answer and act on the answer that Yahweh gives you in his word, you just stepped out of covenant. When you make a decision, or you let's put this another way, you might not have the knowledge and you might darken counsel with Yahweh's people. Our words are very powerful. Other people may be watching us and gleaning information from us, especially on social media. And if you darken Yahweh's counsel with your own wisdom and your own knowledge and give them advice, you could be guilty of not only bringing yourself, but that sheep out of covenant with Yah. So what about uh, leaving any kind of his children astray? Right, and yeah. Uh, leading any of his little children astray, it's better that they had a millstone uh, tied around their neck and they th uh, were thrown off in the sea. We 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 need to be very very careful about um, what we share if we really don't know uh, what the knowledge and wisdom of Yahweh says pertaining that. And that doesn't mean that you are very well versed in an English excuse me in an English Bible. We need to have the Hebrew mind. That's what this program is all about. We need to have the Hebrew mind, the Hebrew thoughts behind what we see in English in order to truly help Yahweh's sheep make the right decisions, eat from the proper fields. Hallelujah. Now, Going back to Galatians chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to go into a couple of verses that will show us what was happening here, because 
what we're going to see when we do this is that Messiah himself has already defined what he was talking about in this chapter in in the uh mainly in the good news uh specifically we're going to be reading uh out of the book of Yohanan or Mark John and Mark to see exactly what Yahshua was meaning or excuse me what Shaul was meaning by saying this we see the law of Messiah but I'm I'm going to uh uh, elaborate on that word law. Law does not always mean the Torah of Moses. There are laws in the Torah. The scroll that Moshe pinned on. Okay, so there's laws in that. But the Torah scroll is not always what this word law is derived from. This word law is also put into the English Bibles wherever the word to wrote should have been, which means instructions that came out of the instruction manual. You have the instruction manual, which is the Torah of Moshe. And it was actually Yahweh's words that Moshe pinned. So we refer to that as the Torah of Yahweh or the Torah of Moshe. And they translated that word Torah as law. They, they translated Torot as law. And they also translated law as law. So everywhere in your English Bibles, you think that it's talking about, uh, for the most part, almost in every instance, the law as in the law of Moses. Again, this is the reason why um, people come to that conclusion whenever they read uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. They think that because they see the words law of Messiah, that the New Testament has the law of Messiah, and the Old Testament has been done away with, which was the law of Moses or the law of Yahweh. That was for them. This is for us. Two separate law, two separate deities, two separate beings which you couldn't be further from the truth. See, if you know that Yahshua was Yahweh in the flesh, then you know that Yahweh could never put up another group of rules for any other group of people other than the ones he was bound to in the Old Testament, which was Israel and Judah. So if you believe that Yahweh was Yahshua, this is very simple to understand. We got the same law. Now, so that word law here, I submit to you, means to wrote. It's the instructions of Messiah. That should read, bear one another's burdens and so complete the instructions of Messiah. All right? Now, first I'm going to go back and show you In John chapter 15, where we started receiving these instructions of Messiah that uh, Shaul or Paul is referring to in this passage. So let's go to John chapter 15. <clears throat> John, the good news, the Besora of Yohanan, the gospel according to John. Beginning at verse 8, we'll read down to all oh, verse 15. Now, here is where Messiah gives us instruction. He's giving us to rote, and they stem from the Torah. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. Now watch. In verse 8, it says, in, my in this my father is esteemed, that you bear much fruit. And this is not talking about your own spiritual fruit. It's talking about you planting seed, having watching it be watered, having it uh, break through the soil, 
having it grow. And there is a, a harvest that Yahweh is going to harvest and you bore fruit for him by you planting the seed. It's not talking about your own spiritual fruit here. In this, my father is esteemed that you bear much fruit and you shall be my taught ones. As the father has loved me, I have loved you. Stay in my love. Now remember, love in Hebrew is to cover, nurture, provide for, care for. Okay? So he's saying, as I have covered you, as I have nurtured you, look what he says. Stay in my love. If you guard my commands, you shall stay in my love. Even as I have guarded my father's commands and stay in his love. It's talking about his covering, his providence, his nurturing. That's what was on the inside of Yahshua, nourishing the flesh. Remember, when Yahshua had fasted all those those days, you know, he. How about how about us going to the scripture that says something like, uh, uh, "I have bread that ye know not of." In other words, the Father, the Spirit, the Ruach was in him. The Word had the Spirit that created it within itself and therefore was able to plant seed for the harvest. He covered the seed. He nurtured the seed. Praise Yah. These words I have spoken to you, so in verse 11, that my joy might be in you. And that your joy might be complete. This is my command. That you love one another. He just gave us an instruction. He just gave us a tarot. His instruction. This being translated a law of Messiah. Okay. No one has greater love than this that he should lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all which I heard from my father I have made known unto you. So the law of Messiah was the instruction of Messiah. And here's where he's laying down the instruction. That he did what? Everything that he gave them, he got from the Father. I have made known to you that which I have heard from my Father. So there is no separate law. He was instructing us from the Torah of Moshe, the law of Yahweh. Another verse that we need to look at is in Mark. Chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. I'm going to have to turn on my air. Mark 12, 28 through 34. Again, what we're going to see here is Yahshua's Tarot his instructions, right? And this is what they have translated once again as law of Messiah. That's where they get that term. But it shouldn't say law. It should be, and it shouldn't say Torah. It should say to wrote the instructions. And we're going to go back to the passage in Galatians to prove that because they use that word two times after verses one and two. <laughs> The, 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 the word always interprets itself. Again, Mark 12, 28 through 34. And one of the scribes coming near, hearing them reasoning together, knowing that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first command of all? And Yahshua answered him, the first of all the commands is, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh is one. Shema Yisrael, 
Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all of your heart, with all of your being, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first command. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. So here we see that Yahshua the Messiah was giving Tarot instructions for the sheep out of the Torah. So he wasn't doing away, just as we saw in the passage in John, he wasn't doing away with the law of Moses or the law of Yahweh given through Moshe. What he was doing was continuing in instructing the people out of the Tanakh. And the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one Elohim, and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart, with all of the understanding, and with all thy being, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the burnt offerings and offerings. And when Yahshua saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the reign of Elohim. Do you understand what that means? This man that he was speaking to was waiting on the Messiah. And what he was telling him was, you understand the instructions that I'm speaking about out of the Torah. But if you would only accept me, if you would only accept me as your Mashiach, then you would be in the kingdom. He said, you're not far from the kingdom, but here I am right before you. This is the way that it has been meant to be delivered to the sheep for millennia. The teachings of Messiah were further instructions out of the Torah and the prophets. There is no such thing as a law of Messiah. That's an English doctrine. It doesn't exist in the Hebrew. It was to wrote instructions in Torah to the sheep. And we're going to prove that by going back to the original source of our study and question in Galatians chapter 6. Picking up in verse 3 in Galatians chapter 6, it says, For if anyone thinks himself to be somebody when he is not, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he shall be he shall have boasting in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall hear, excuse me, bear his own burden. And let him who is what instructed in the word. Okay, so there we go with the tarot, the instructions. It says, and let him who is instructed in the word share in all that is good, tobe, with him who is instructing. It's talking about the instructions. Bear one another's burdens and so complete the instructions of Messiah that came from the law and the prophets. <laughs> oh, Father, hallelujah. So there's the word instructed or instructing twice in that one verse, uh, validating everything that we just saw in what we were studying and what I was saying concerning the Hebrew word Torah and the Hebrew word Torah. It has to do with instructions. The context of the chapter is instructions, not law. Clearly in scripture, we see this. Verse 7 says, do not be led astray. Elohim is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. This is not a New Testament teaching, everyone. Uh, let's go to Ecclesiastes. Where's that at? Um, Ecclesiastes. 
Ecclesiastes, Koheleth, in your scriptures, chapter 11. Yes, verses 4 through 7. That is where this teaching comes from. Further instructions out of the law and the prophets. <laughs> oh, we, I mean, it's almost like beating a dead dog. I'm sorry, but we, we've got to make these connections. And um, if you're not writing this down, come back and watch us again and write them down to share this with people that think there is a law of Messiah. That's just not true. Yahshua come, taught, uh, come and taught us the same things that were taught to us by the law and the prophets. Remember the... <laughs> Remember, Malachi is very happy about it. Now, remember, so we have, um, oh, I lost it. Malachi got me off track. <laughs> okay, but we'll come back to it. Now, look, so here we have in Koheleth or Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. Listen what he says. This is where this teaching in uh, verse 7 in Galatians chapter 6, that's where it's stemming from, are these words that this man would have been very familiar with. Verse 4 in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 says, He who watches the wind does not sow. And he who looks at the clouds does not reap. As you do not know, what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. So you do not know the works of Elohim who makes all. Sow your seed in the morning and until evening, do not let your hand rest since you do not know which prosper this or that, or whether both alike are tov good. What he's saying is, when you go to plant seeds for Yahweh, that you bear much fruit, make sure that you don't do it just in one area. From the time you rise to the time you go to sleep, you need to be planting seeds in different places because you never know what ground is going to permeate into fruit that Yahweh will harvest. Verse 7 says, sweet also is the light and good for the eyes to see the sun. So this is this is talking about, uh, in, in a Hebrew expression, is talking about planting seed in people from the time you wake up till the time you go to bed. Because you don't know whether this seed, that seed, or this seed is going to grow or not inside of that individual. So what you sow, that you're also going to reap. So if you don't sow much, you're not going to reap much. There's a parable about that. You had laborers that went into the field, and they worked this long, and then they worked all day long, and then where there, there were workers that came in towards the end of the day, and they all received the same wages. They all planted seed from the time they were hired to do so, and they all received the same wages. Do not be led astray. Elohim is not mocked. So that means that Yahweh said something somewhere in his word. And that's where he got this. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. And we just read it in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Now reading uh, verse 8 through 10 in Galatians 6. It says, because he who sows to his own flesh... You see that? So if you keep your the seed that Yahweh has given you within your own body, what's that going to profit? Nothing. Because he who sows to his own flesh shall reap corruption from the flesh. <laughs> but he who sows to what was breathed by Yahweh, they translate that as spirit, shall reap everlasting life from the one who breathed it, from the spirit himself. See, the wages at the end of the day are going to be the same. And you be not led astray for whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. If you sow a little, you're going to reap little. 
But when you get put in the game, if you work hard, you're going to reap much. <laughs> Praise you. And let us not lose heart in doing good. For And here we see that word good. I'm going to go ahead and I've got that on my, on my board as well. It's the word tob. And it comes up so many times we need to take a look at it. And let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due season, there's Moedim right there. In due season, there, there is a, uh, uh, a spring harvest and a fall harvest. Those are the two resurrections of the dead. That's what those harvests represent. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, as we have occasion, let us do tob, let us do good, to all, especially to those who are of the household of our belief. Now, to do good, what does it mean? I'm going to show you. Okay, so here is the word tob. Tet. Wa bet tob. So there now this the the tet can mean uh uh to contain or surround something. The wa is to connect or fasten something like a tent four peg, that's what it is, or a nail does. And then we have the bet. So it says um do good. That means surround others with what you're connected to in Yahweh's house, which is what? When you love one another, covering, nurturing, and providing for. Even your enemies, you're supposed to do that too. You send them relief. You send them prayers. So that there's no English definition of hatred involved in whatever you may be going through with your enemies. Because if you pray for your enemies, you will it will be like you're hoping heaping coals of fire upon their heads. In other words, we're doing what Yahweh says to do by doing good, by surrounding others with the things that we are connected to the household of Yahweh by. We could not be connected to the household of Yahweh without what? His covering. His righteousness, his rules, his regulation, and him pro uh, providing food, water, and those types of things too as well. It's not the English definition of good that's being spoken about here. It's Tob. Surround them with the same goodness that Yahweh has given us. Hallelujah. And sometimes that might be hard because, you know, our human nature is to, you know, well, I don't really care that much for that guy. Maybe he's getting what he had coming. Well, if we all got what we had coming, I wouldn't be sitting here sharing the word of Yah in his wonderful language with you. Okay, there's a time for admonishment. There's a time for sternness, but there's also a time to reach out with uh, to people with uh, knowledge and wisdom and understanding and if you can conjure it up, a little bit of patience. <laughs> Hallelujah. So again, in that last verse, verse 10, it says, So then, as we have occasion, let us do good. Let us uh, cover and nurture and provide. Let us surround people with those good things to all, especially to those who are of the household of our belief. To bring somebody that is seeking out your mighty one into your home, into the land that Yahweh has given you as an inheritance, is always a customary practice of a true Hebrew Israelite. Praise Yah. Albeit, if the person is not violent <laughs> or out to do harm, misunderstanding, uh, or just uh, an all-around mess. It's not talking about that. We can reach out to those people in a different way, probably the same way that Yahweh reached out to us in the very beginning of our coming to our senses. 
Praise God. Now, so answering the next question, we're going to be going to Psalms chapter 106. Psalms 106, 1 through 7, they say, It clearly shows our inability to always please Yahweh. Why does he even bother with us? So let's read verses 1 through 7 in, in chapter 106. Chapter 1 through 7 in verse, or excuse me, verses 1 through 7 in chapter 106 of Tehillim or Psalms. Praise Yah, O oh, give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his kindness is everlasting. What does relate the mighty acts of Yahweh or declare all his praise? Blessed are those who guard right ruling, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Yahweh, in the acceptance of your people. Visit me with your salvation. That's talking about the second resurrection of the dead right there. to see the good of your chosen ones, to rejoice in the gladness of your nation, to make my boast with your inheritance. Look what, look what they say. We have sinned with our fathers. We have acted perversely. We have done wrong. Our fathers in Egypt or Mitzrayim did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your many kindnesses, your many kindnesses but rebelled by the sea the sea of reeds so the person that sent in this question said why does he even bother showing us kindness and mercy and 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 all of that if that's what we have done to him you know why does he even bother well i want to move forward because actually this is putting it lightly and uh We'll come back to that set of verses in just a moment. But I would like to take a look at verses 13 through 21. It says, they soon forgot his works. So you see, it gets worse. The description of the, of the author here actually gets worse and would deepen the question that was asked. Yeah, why does he bother? But the answer is in this chapter. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel but greedily lusted in the wilderness and tried El in the desert. And he gave them the requests. That's what you want. And that's what you'll get. Instead of saying, not my will, but your will be done. Feed me with that which you know is good for me. They were like, give me what I want. Feed my flesh. Greedily. And he gave them the request, but sent leanness within their being. Sometimes you get that thing that the flesh wants, and what happens? Your soul begins to go, man, why did I do that? Why did I even think that it would make me feel better? Why did I think that what he wants is so much less important for me than what I want myself? You're right. Well, why does he bother? But again, the answer is here. Verse 16 says, And they were jealous of Moshe in the camp of Aaron, the set-apart one of Yahweh. Then the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the company of Abiram, and a fire burned in their company. A flame consumed the wrong. They made a calf in Horeb and bowed down to a molded image. Thus they changed my esteem into the form of an ox that eats grass. They forgot El, their savior, the doer of great deeds in Mitzrayim. So it is a great question, especially reading further into the chapter. Then we look at verse 28. It says, 
and they joined themselves to Baal Peor and ate offerings, slaughterings, sacrifices made to the dead. So yeah, they joined themselves to false mighty ones and they had uh, Christmas dinners and uh, some Easter ham sandwiches. To be all pure and ate offerings. And then we look at verses 32 through 39. And they pro provoked wrath at the waters of Meribah, and Moshe suffered on account of them, because they embittered his spirit, and he spoke rashly with his lips. They did not destroy the people, as Yahweh has commanded them, but mixed with the Gentiles, and learned their works, and served their idols, and they became a snare to them. Again, that's what's happened, is many of the believers that come out of the church want to go right back into it and keep fellowshipping with, with these people, knowing that they're celebrating all of these pagan deities' holidays. Doing the same thing. We've got to get away from that. It said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith Yahweh. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. In verse 36, again, it says, they served their idols, and they became a snare to them. And they slaughtered their sons and their daughters to demons. And they shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they offered to the idols of Canaan. And that's another problem that we have in uh, the Melchizedek order and its priesthood as well, is we have those who want the covering of the Melchizedek. But again, they want to go fellowship with all of these people, and, they, and they're giving their children over to all of these uh, uh, false deities, thoughts, ways of life, and they say, oh, it's because the children want to have fun. Come on now. We can get together with a nice Melchizedek priesthood group somewhere and have plenty of fun for the kids. <laughs> and the land was defiled with blood, so they became unclean by their own works. So, yes. Why does Yahweh bother? We've done unjustly. We killed his prophets. We killed his son. We've trampled the land that he promised us, defiled it, and it's defiled to this very day. And the people have become mixed out here in the nations, lost their identity, and there are very few of us that are waking up to realize we are supposed to be set apart and sanctified from all of that and leaving it behind. The only reason why he bothers is to show the power and the esteem of his set-apart name. Had the person who sent me this question just read one more verse, it actually answers that question. But before we go there, let's look at verses 40. And the wrath of Yahweh burned against his people, and he loathed his own inheritance. Verse 43, many times he delivered them, but they rebelled in their plans. You see, that's what we were going over just a moment ago in that Hebrew word study. When your plans go beyond the confines, you just cannot fix certain things that you have got yourself into with your own plans. We are incapable of fixing it with our own plans. We must do it with the diagram that he has shown us.
verse 47 and 48 at the end of the chapter. Save us, O Yahweh, our Elohim, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your set apart name, to exalt you, but to exalt in your praise. Blessed be Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people shall say, when he does deliver us, Amen. Praise Yah. So what this is showing us is after all of these things that Yahweh or actually we have put ourselves through. And after all of the lengthy, hard correction stemming from our father. Many of us will learn our lesson and turn to Yahweh to bring us back home. Save us, O Yahweh, our Elohim, and gather us from among the nations to give thanks to your set-apart name, to exult in your praise. The answer to the question is in Psalms 106 and at verse 8. But he saved them for his namesake to make known his might, his power. You see, we're not going to be made a nation again just because we repented. We're not going to be made a nation again just because we turned to the Torah. But the main objective here by Yahweh and the reason why he bothers with us is to show the mightiness, the awesomeness, and the power of his holy sacred name. According to this passage, he's going to save us for his namesake, that his power will be made known to all nations when he gathers his people. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. So, um, again, join us tomorrow uh, for our Seeker Sabbath Live in which we're going to be going over the Torah portions. And I have a PowerPoint ready uh, for that event as well. And uh, also, if you would like to join us for Sukkot, our venue is up. Uh, you can go to www.yahwaysmessenger.com, and you can go to Tabernacles 2019 tab and click on there, and you'll see all of our uh, regulations, rules, and uh, dates and times and all of that right there. If you would like to join us, please give us a call at 208-553-8393. And, uh, you know, let us have a little sit down in the chat before you decide to come. We would appreciate it. And may Yahweh bless and keep each and every one of you. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. May Yahweh bless and keep you. And Shalom.